The first time I uploaded this video, I was hit with a wave of posts from people who pointed out a minor error that I had described the founder of PragerU as a Christian rather than a Jew. That makes absolutely no difference to PragerU's misrepresentation of science by its two presenters, but even after I issued an immediate correction, the posts still kept coming. So I decided to eliminate this distraction and re-edit the video. It'll be interesting to see if the complainants are now willing to show equal indignation at PragerU's errors. I'll discuss this in more detail later in the video. Thanks for watching. Perhaps the best arguments for his existence come from, of all places, science itself. Scientific evidence for God. Sounds convincing. I first encountered Prager University, Prager U, when I did a video a few months ago debunking Patrick Moore. Each week, Prager U offers a new course. Each week, we teach what isn't taught, but should be. How faith, reason, and science are fully compatible. It's different from most universities in that it's not an accredited university. It's a video channel run by a religious talk radio host. It doesn't have a campus or any degrees. After I watched the video Science vs. God, or as PragerU put it, completed the course, I didn't get a degree, but I did earn a badge. I'm wearing it now. So what is the scientific evidence for God? It turns out it's just a repeat of an old creationist claim that the universe is finely tuned, and something finely tuned is impossible. So something else that's finely tuned must have caused it. Which, of course, doesn't make any sense, but we'll come on to that in a minute. And the other scientific evidence is that the number of planets in our galaxy harbouring life is probably only a few thousand. So what's the story, Eric? Here's the story. The same year Time featured its now famous headline, the astronomer Carl Sagan announced that there were two necessary criteria for a planet to support life. The right kind of star and a planet the right distance from that star. Given the roughly octillion planets in the universe, that's one followed by 24 zeros, there should have been about septillion planets, that's one followed by 21 zeros, capable of supporting life. With such spectacular odds, scientists were optimistic that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, known by its initials SETI, an ambitious project launched in the 1960s, was sure to turn up something soon. With a vast radio telescopic network, scientists listened for signals that resembled coded intelligence. But as the years passed, the silence from the universe was deafening. OK, couple of things here. Firstly, SETI wasn't listening in on the whole universe. It was listening in on only a fraction of one galaxy out of a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. Secondly, that's intelligent life, Eric. What you were talking about at the beginning was simply life. Nice switch, by the way. And for that, Sagan was basically right. You just need the right kind of star and a planet the right distance from that star. Not so close that water is all boiled away and not so far that it turns to ice. As of 2014, researchers have discovered precisely bubkis. How many? Not a Come again. zilch. Can you enumerate? Which is to say zero followed by an infinite number of zeros. All right, Eric, don't over-egg the pudding. Look, even if we detect nada, zilch, 0.0000, because every galaxy has just one planet harbouring intelligent life, in other words, we're completely alone in our galaxy, that still means there would be over a hundred billion planets harbouring intelligent life in the universe as a whole, because, as I said, there are over a hundred billion galaxies. Eric doesn't tell us who's made these 50 criteria for life, so it's impossible to check it. But NASA, which does know a thing or two about finding life on other planets, has just three criteria. The planet must be warm and it must have water, which we now know is pretty universal. They've only added one thing to Sagan's criteria, it must have oxygen. Even PragerU admits that with these 50 unnamed criteria and an unsourced claim of a falling number of habitable planets, the numbers are still running in the thousands. Thousands of habitable planets in our galaxy alone translates into hundreds of trillions in the universe. Even SETI proponents acknowledge the problem. Peter Schenkel wrote in a 2006 piece for Skeptical Inquirer, a magazine that strongly affirms atheism, in light of new findings and insights, we should quietly admit that the early estimates may no longer be tenable. Ah, yes, the inevitable changed quote. 
So how did PragerU alter what Peter Schenkel actually wrote? Well, here's the original in Skeptical Inquirer. We should quietly admit that the early estimates, that there may be a million, a hundred thousand, or ten thousand advanced extraterrestrial civilizations in our galaxy, may no longer be tenable. So what PragerU left out was that Schenkel wasn't talking about life, he was talking about intelligent life. And he wasn't referring to our universe, he was referring to our galaxy. And he specifically stated that the early estimates he was referring to ran into the hundreds of thousands. PragerU also chopped off the next line of Schenkel's quote, There might not be a hundred, not even ten such civilizations. The mashed-up misquote makes it appear as though Schenkel's dismissing the idea of life in the universe, whereas in fact he's simply reducing the estimates for intelligent life, not life, in our galaxy, not the universe, from hundreds of thousands to perhaps hundreds or just ten. But even that would translate to trillions of civilizations in the universe as a whole, and if that's the number of planets possibly harboring intelligent life, that could mean a thousand times more, harboring life at least the size of an amoeba. That's a huge number, and very far from the claim of impossible odds that PragerU is trying to conclude. So PragerU has completely misrepresented what Schenkel said by changing his quote and giving no indication that it changed his quote. Hang on, didn't PragerU do a course about that? that you live by the following nine commandments. And the ninth commandment says, thou shalt not deceive people by changing a quote to fit your conclusion. The odds against life in the universe are astonishing. Yet, here we are, not only existing, but talking about existing. What can account for it? Well, I'll tell you. The best way to beat incredible odds is to have an even larger number of events. If I want to get ten heads in a row when I toss a coin... The odds against that happening are 1,024 to 1. So to beat those odds, I have to flip the coin 2,000 times. And if the odds against a planet harbouring life are a billion to 1, then the way to beat those odds is to have a few billion planets. Problem solved. At this point, let me ask all those who wrote in, does the fact that I called Dennis Prager religious at the beginning of this video rather than Christian make any difference to the fact that PragerU miscalculated the number of habitable planets by 100 billion, or that it mixed up life with intelligent life, or that it deliberately changed a quote by Peter Schenkel to support its conclusions? Of course not. But even after I corrected the error, I got indignant comments from people who thought I should have known that Prager was a Jew. What on earth is wrong with me? It's not exactly a secret. I'm a huge fan of Dennis Prager. It's well known he's Jewish. Anyone who's listened to more than an hour of his radio show would know he was a Jew. OK, it's also well known that Magda Subansky is a lesbian. And it's not exactly a secret that she has a weight problem. She's discussed it quite openly. But if you've never heard of her and didn't know any of this because you live in the USA, well, maybe you'll understand why I had never heard of Dennis Prager or his famous Jewishness. I live in Australia, where we don't get his radio show, we don't get ads from PragerU on YouTube, and no one's ever heard of Dennis Prager or his university. I first heard about him five months ago when I was researching Patrick Moore's PragerU presentation. I might have read in passing that Dennis Prager was Jewish and that Eric Metaxas and Frank Pastore were Christian and Patrick Moore is whatever he is, but it's irrelevant. What was more important were their scientific claims, and that took a huge amount of research, checking and double-checking, tracking down their sources, discovering their miscalculations and their misquotes, and finding out how they had misrepresented all the scientific research. Now, I do my best to fact-check even things that aren't relevant, but every now and then a small error will slip by, and as soon as it's pointed out, I always correct it. So here's my challenge to PragerU fans. Let's now see your equally indignant posts about the numerous errors PragerU has made, which, unlike mine, were not corrected and in one case appear to be deliberate deception. I look forward to reading them. But wait, there's more. Oh, what now? The fine-tuning necessary for life to exist on a planet is nothing compared with the fine-tuning required for the universe to exist at all. For example, astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear forces 
were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Alter any one of these four values ever so slightly, and the universe as we know it could not exist. And yet we know it did happen, because it does exist. So how did the universe overcome the incredible odds against its existence? Well, perhaps the same way that life did. As we've seen, the way to beat huge odds is to have an even bigger number of events. In other words, have many Big Bangs and many different universes with different values for the fundamental forces. Some universes will have stars and planets, others won't. That may sound ridiculous, but perhaps not as ridiculous as other ideas about how our universe started, and at least the multiverse hypothesis has some evidence to support it. It all starts with a very odd experiment. The double slit experiment sends light, that's a beam of photons, through two slits. It also works with a beam of electrons. The light forms an interference pattern on a screen on the other side, and the nature of that pattern suggests that light is a wave. But the pattern also forms in such a way that it shows light comprises particles, photons. The only conclusion is that light is both a wave and a particle. But here's the really weird part. The experiment works even if you send just one photon or one electron through the slits. The particle interference pattern suggests that the particle goes through both slits at the same time. The same thing happens with electrons. The only conclusion is that these particles can be in two places at the same time, and physicists have subsequently discovered that this extends to other particles in the quantum world and even properties like direction of spin. Wait, it gets weirder still. As soon as you set up a detector to track the particle, the interference pattern disappears and the particle only goes through one slit. It seems as though the act of observing the dual nature of a particle makes the effect disappear. By the way, to all the physicists out there, yes, it's much more complicated than that and has to do with quantum superposition and wave function and wave function collapse and particles being packets of energy. I'm just not going to get into all of that. Neither am I going to go into why Schrodinger devised the next experiment you're going to see because none of this is relevant to the video. I'll list further reading material in the video description if anyone is interested in learning the details. OK, so what happens when we scale that up to the world we inhabit? Well, ordinarily, it doesn't work. We can only observe one of the possible states. So maybe the other is observed in a parallel universe. In 1935, Erwin Schrödinger set up a thought experiment that illustrates this. Imagine you have a cat inside a sealed box, so you can't observe it. Next to it is a radioactive atom that can emit a particle through radioactive decay. And underneath that is a Geiger counter, hammer and a poison gas bottle. If a particle is emitted, it'll trigger the Geiger counter that releases the hammer, smashes the bottle and the gas then kills the cat. If nothing is emitted, then nothing will happen and the cat will live. Remember, you can't see inside the box, but you know through quantum physics that the atom is in two states. It's released the particle, and it hasn't released the particle, which means that the cat must be dead and alive at the same time. You can't open the box and see that, because as soon as you open the box, the cat appears to you in only one state, either alive or dead. One explanation is that there may be a parallel universe somewhere where the cat is in the other state. And if there are two universes to account for the dual state of a single particle, how many universes must there be to account for all the different states of all the different particles, an almost infinite number? Another more recent theory is that the quantum effect breaks down as objects get larger and the force of gravity becomes more significant. But the effect on a quantum scale is no less real. So if all this blows your mind, yes it should, because the world of science, where space is curved, where time slows down when objects move faster, and where particles can be in two places at the same time, in other words, the world we actually live in, is far more fascinating than any mythological world of gods and goblins that we can invent. So there's no reason to believe there was only one Big Bang. 
Many physicists have suggested that Big Bangs may be happening all the time. We don't know, of course, but we could be one of trillions of universes expanding like bubbles over billions of years and then dying. Which would mean there are thousands of universes where the values of the four forces are just right to form stars. Astrophysics and quantum physics may provide some theoretical evidence for this, but the plain fact is we just don't know yet. And making something up and being absolutely sure it's the blind honest truth doesn't mean we do know. So what was the Big Bang? I mean our Big Bang. Fortunately, PragerU has a course on this too. Here's another video caster, oh, I mean university lecturer, the late Frank Pastore. I mean, we're all familiar with the first Big Bang, right? It's usually the answer given to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? It's the idea that there was nothing, it popped, and boom, there's something. I mean, that time, matter, and space all came into existence in some great cosmological flash about six Okay, the first thing I always ago. suggest creationists do if they want to rebut science is find out what the science actually says. The idea that there was a boom that caused matter to appear out of nowhere is not the Big Bang Theory. It's what creationists think the Big Bang Theory says. The theory, which is actually called cosmic inflation theory, says that matter came from singularity, a dense point of energy. After all, matter and energy are interchangeable. Where did singularity come from? Oddly, that's a moot question, because time in our universe began with the Big Bang, which means that singularity was, to all intents and purposes, timeless. It was eternal. Some creationists argue that that's impossible, and yet their entire religion is based on the idea of something eternal. Time in our universe began when singularity expanded and energy condensed into matter. What caused that? The short answer is, again, we don't know, and creationists don't know either. They can give it a name, but whatever you want to call it, call it Spinax, Fredleg, God or Doodlebug, we still need to know what that thing is and how it worked. Did it interact with another universe? How did expansion overcome gravitational forces? Is singularity a white hole? In other words, a black hole in reverse. And if so, how does a black hole reverse itself and instead of contracting space-time, expand it? These questions won't be answered by people in pulpits making things up. They'll be discovered in particle accelerators and radio telescope observatories. Because, believe it or not, the hard part of physics isn't making up names for things. The best way to illustrate this is through Star Trek's transporter, which measures each particle in the transportee's body and recreates it somewhere else in exactly the same configuration. It was a plot device used to avoid long and messy transfers between scenes, but it presented Star Trek's creator with a scientific problem. According to the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, which is part of the Copenhagen interpretation, you can't measure both the position of a particle and its momentum. The more accurately you measure one, the less accurately you can measure the other. So Roddenberry decided that the transporter would include a device that can overcome the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, called a Heisenberg Compensator. Someone once asked Star Trek's technical advisor how it worked. He answered, Very well, thank you. That's the beauty of being able to just make things up and give them names, rather than having to explain how they work. A bit like this thing they're calling God. All creationists have done is give the cause of cosmic inflation a name. How did it work? Well, um, mm, very successfully, thank you. So yes, you can make up any story you like, that the Big Bang was caused by a giant rabbit or a bearded man or an invisible witch, and give it any name you like. But one thing we do know it was not is any of the gods we've invented on Earth, because these mythical figures allegedly performed deeds that we know never happened. Take the Japanese gods Izanagi and Izanami, for example. They were supposed to have created the Japanese islands, but we now know that the Japanese islands were formed by the collision of crustal plates. The Chinese goddess Nua supposedly made humans out of clay, but we now know that humans evolved. And the Jewish god, who supposedly looks like us, is believed to have flooded the earth a few thousand years ago and killed all the people and animals that inhabited it. But we now know that no such flood ever occurred. If you don't get why this dismisses the notion of these gods, 
It's like me telling you that a giant dragon has burnt down the White House with its fiery breath and killed everyone inside. If you go to Washington the same day I tell you this and discover that the White House is still there and everyone inside is still alive, you might suspect that this dragon is a figment of my imagination. Now, how many times have I said in this video, we don't know? We don't know what caused the Big Bang. We don't know why a particle can be in two places at the same time. We don't know a lot of things. But conversely, there are also things we do know. We know that humans evolved and were not made out of clay by a Chinese goddess. And we know that an invisible god didn't flood the earth a few thousand years ago because we know there was no such flood. So that's how we know that whatever force of physics caused the Big Bang, it's not going to be a mythical Bronze Age deity looking out for billions of years across the vast expanse of space, containing over a hundred billion galaxies, and then homing in on just one of those billions of galaxies, and then through the vast space within that galaxy, containing hundreds of billions of stars, focusing his attention on just one star system, and a tiny planet orbiting that very ordinary star, and taking a keen interest in a chariot battle.